Hello, my fellow weirdlings. It's Margo, and today we're going to talk about how the rivalry between inventors Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla culminated in a weird foray into experimenting with ghost hunting equipment. If you're ready for some strange history, keep watching. Though they're both widely seen as two of the most prolific inventors the world has ever known, Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla couldn't have been much different if they tried. These differences, among other things, led to one of the greatest rivalries of all time that perhaps even carried over into the afterlife. I'll start with a quick overview of how they got there. Thomas Alva Edison was born on February 11, 1847 in Milan, Ohio. He was the seventh and last child, only four of which lived to adulthood, of Samuel and Nancy Edison. Samuel was a shingle maker and Nancy was formerly a school teacher. Growing up, Thomas was called Al. He was often in poor health when very young. Edison grew up in Port Huron, Michigan from the time he was seven years old until he began living on his own at the age of 16 as a full-time telegrapher. Edison had very little formal education, only attending school for about three months at age seven. It said that his teacher was convinced he was stupid and told his mother something was wrong with him. This angered Nancy Edison, and she decided to homeschool her son, teaching him reading, writing, and arithmetic. Her son turned out to be a very bright and curious child, who taught himself quite a lot by reading on his own. This began a belief in self-improvement that stuck with Edison throughout his life. He enjoyed reading scientific and technical books, but also had a love of poetry. Edison was inspired by his mother and wanted to prove he was smart like her. The only real challenge Edison faced in pursuing secondary education at the time was deafness, which occurred at around age 12. He was said to be totally deaf in one ear and hard of hearing in the other. He felt that the peace and quiet helped him to think better. He considered his deafness an advantage in many ways. For one, it kept conversation short so he had more time to focus on work. Edison began working at an early age, as was common for boys at the time. When young Al Edison was a teenager, he saved a three-year-old from being killed by a train. This incident is what got him started in telegraphy, when the child's grateful father, J.U. McKenzie, taught him railroad telegraphy as a reward. The rapid growth of the communication revolution after the invention of the telegraph allowed Edison and other telegraphers the chance to travel, see the country, and gain experience. Edison settled in Boston in 1868, working in a Western Union office. This is where he began shifting his profession from telegraph operator to inventor. His first patent was for an electric vote recorder, intended to speed up the voting process. This invention was a commercial failure, and Edison vowed to only invent things he was certain the public would want from that point on. He set up his permanent laboratory at Menlo Park, New Jersey, located in what is now known as Edison, New Jersey. Edison is credited with inventing the incandescent light bulb, the motion camera, and the phonograph, and filed an astounding 1,093 patents throughout his career. Nikola Tesla was born at midnight on July 10, 1856, in the city of Smiljan, in what is now known as Croatia, to Serbian parents. He was the fourth of five children. As a child, he was known as Niko. His father, Milutin, was a stern but loving Orthodox priest. He was gifted at writing and poetry. Growing up, Tesla immersed himself in his father's library. His mother, Duka, created appliances in her spare time to help around the home and farm. One of these inventions was a mechanical egg beater. Duca had an eidetic memory, the ability to recall an image from memory with high accuracy, which is a trait she passed on to her son. According to Tesla family legend, he was born during a violent lightning storm. Halfway through his birth, the midwife, seeing the storm as a bad omen, declared this child will be a child of darkness, to which his mother responded, no, he will be a child of light. In hindsight, those words seem rather prophetic. When Tesla was five years old, he witnessed the death of his older brother, who'd fallen from a horse. This experience haunted him for the rest of his life. As a young child, Tesla already displayed a brilliant mind and would invent toys, including a small windmill powered by a flying June bug. He was fascinated with electricity and thunderstorms. Even then, his goal was to harness the energies of nature to the service of man. 
but he didn't really begin to see himself as an inventor until he was a young adult. During his childhood, Tesla also began to see visions with flashes of light, getting confused about what was real and what was imaginary. That never fully went away. While this could be seen as a disability, this vision allowed Tesla to mentally visualize inventions in such vivid detail that he didn't even need to draw them out on paper. Growing up, Tesla always excelled in his studies with a passion for mathematics and sciences. Tesla dreamed of becoming an engineer, but was strongly pressured by his father to enter the priesthood. When he contracted cholera at age 17, Tesla's father promised him that if he survived, he'd be allowed to attend the renowned Austrian Polytechnic School in Graz, Austria. That promise was fulfilled. Tesla didn't complete his degree at the Polytechnic School, though he did later enroll at the University of Prague in what was then Bohemia, today known as the Czech Republic. He didn't graduate from there either, leaving school when his father died. After university, Tesla took a job with the Continental Edison Company in Paris. That included duties as a telephone line repairman. This gave him an opportunity to experiment with the equipment, where he created an amplifier that was a precursor to the loudspeaker. He didn't bother to patent this invention, which would become a poor business habit that would recur throughout his life. Though he is credited with many important inventions, including the channeling of alternating current, fluorescent and neon lighting, wireless telegraphy, and the giant turbines that harness the power of Niagara Falls. In 1884, Tesla immigrated to the United States, and shortly thereafter, the paths of Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison would cross for the first time. As you can see from these brief biographies, Edison and Tesla had very different upbringings, and they grew to be two very different men. But shortly after Tesla arrived in the U.S., the two found themselves in the same exact place, with Tesla working at Edison's laboratory for less than a year. At this time, Edison was already a successful inventor and businessman, and Tesla a promising young engineer, though Edison called Tesla's ideas splendid but utterly impractical. Though Tesla improved and designed many of Edison's new machines, it's rumored that he left underpaid when Edison's business manager, Charles Batchelor, refused Tesla's request for a raise from $18 to $25 a week, reportedly stating, no, the woods are full of men like Tesla. I can get any number of them I want for $18 a week. And with that declaration of abject ignorance, Edison and Tesla went their separate ways, for the most part. While Edison's goal was to invent for profit, Tesla felt we should be able to power the world for free. This didn't sit well with wealthy financiers, who basically saw Tesla as a threat to capitalism. There always seemed to be a friction between Edison and Tesla, which in my opinion probably made them both better inventors. Both of their careers continued to advance, though the two employed very different methods in their process of invention. While Edison experimented tirelessly, Tesla would visualize his inventions in his mind and draw them out on paper before ever picking up a tool. Tesla was consumed with cleanliness, a result of reportedly having obsessive compulsive disorder, while Edison, according to Tesla, lived in utter disregard of the most elementary rules of hygiene. It's hard to picture these two working side by side in the same lab. Another bone of contention between the two, according to Tesla, was that Edison or his manager had reportedly once promised Tesla that if he could improve Edison's DC generators, he'd pay Tesla a $50,000 bonus. Upon making the desired improvements, Edison told Tesla that the bonus had been a joke. However, there were also a few similarities between the two men. Both had their own eccentricities and egos, and both were obsessive workers. Both men courted the press, inviting them to witness the spectacles of invention they dramatically put on display. Edison is also often accused of stealing Tesla's ideas. Other inventors of the time are accused as well. A topic Tesla once addressed with the quote, I don't care that they stole my idea. I care that they don't have any of their own. Tesla apparently did care very little if other inventors pirated his ideas, considering he seldom got royalties on what he had patented and didn't seem awfully upset about it, though some did seem to bother him more than others. Edison, on the other hand, was all business. 
This rivalry really came to a head with what's come to be known as the War of the Currents. Edison developed direct current, or DC, a current that runs continually in a single direction, like in a battery or fuel cell. According to the U.S. Department of Energy History, during the early years of electricity, direct current was the standard in the U.S., but there was one problem. Direct current is not easily converted to higher or lower voltages. So along comes Tesla, who believed alternating current, or AC, was the solution to that problem. Also according to the U.S. Department of Energy History, alternating current reverses direction a certain number of times per second, 60 in the U.S., and can be converted to different voltages relatively easily using a transformer. With the backing of fellow inventor and entrepreneur George Westinghouse, Tesla was able to make that happen. What followed became a public relations battle between Tesla's AC and Edison's safer but more limited DC that Tesla would ultimately win. With the aid of Westinghouse, Tesla was also able to harness the power of Niagara Falls on a grand scale. This was a dream Tesla had actually held on to since he was a child in Croatia. Upon seeing a steel engraving of Niagara Falls, young Nico Tesla had told an uncle that he'd one day go to America and capture the energy of those falls. Thirty years later, he made that dream a reality. According to the Department of Energy, on November 16, 1896, Buffalo was lit up by the alternating current from Niagara Falls. By this time, General Electric, which previously supported DC, had decided to jump on the alternating current train too. It would appear that alternating current had all but obliterated direct current. Today, we use primarily AC, but DC power is used for computers, solar cells, etc. But the Edison-Tesla rivalry wasn't always as cutthroat as history would make it out to be. In May of 1895, Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla both attended the National Electrical Exposition in Philadelphia. At this exposition, Edison is quoted as saying, The most amazing thing at this exposition is the demonstration by Tesla of the ability to deliver here an electric current generated at Niagara Falls. To my mind, it solves one of the most important questions associated with electrical development. Edison also graciously offered laboratory space to Tesla after a devastating March 1895 fire destroyed Tesla's laboratory and basically most of his life's work. 1918 to 1920 brought an influenza pandemic that killed about 50 million people worldwide. This was on the heels of World War I, which ended the same year the pandemic began and had left an estimated worldwide death toll of 20 million. In both cases, many of the victims were young, between 20 and 40 years old. This staggering loss greatly changed the cultural landscape of America, leaving many wanting answers about the afterlife and longing to speak to their lost loved ones one last time. Interspiritualism These attempts to communicate with the dead were usually facilitated by people claiming to be spiritual mediums and a relatively new household spirit communication device called the Ouija board, which had actually been around since the 1890s. The heightened interest in spiritualism in the U.S. continued throughout the 1920s and well into the 1930s, only really diminishing with the beginning of World War II in 1941. I'm not sure how much attention Nikola Tesla actually paid to the spiritualism trend, but one of his experiments ended up landing him right in the middle of it. With his risky interest in harnessing electrical energy, and during some childhood incidents, Tesla himself had nearly died multiple times. During one experiment, an electrical bolt jumped three feet through the air and struck him directly over the heart. He'd also survived cholera and been stranded on snowy mountaintops. Having also witnessed the sudden death of his older brother at such a young age, and coming from a deeply religious family, I'm sure Tesla had many questions of his own about death and what may happen afterward. There are stories of Tesla exploring spirituality in his adult years, though he seemed pretty skeptical. Science fiction of the time was also dabbling with the idea of connecting electromagnetism with the occult. Even then, Tesla was seen as something of a sci-fi wizard. To this day, that hasn't changed, and for good reason. 
Tesla was a very eccentric individual, living alone in hotel rooms, dedicating his entire life to scientific discovery, barely eating or sleeping, taking daily electric baths, and avoiding touching other people. He was dubbed a mad scientist. In 1901, Tesla was experimenting with a crystal radio, powered by electromagnetic waves. One night, he picked up some signals from the radio that, simply put, scared the crap out of him. He wrote in his diary, My first observations positively terrified me, as there was present in them something mysterious, not to say supernatural, and I was alone in my laboratory at night. This leads many modern paranormal enthusiasts to wonder, could these sounds that so frightened the famed scientist have been the first reported electronic voice phenomena? Electronic voice phenomena, or EVPs, are sounds found on electronic recordings that are interpreted as spirit voices. In 1918, Tesla again wrote of similar sounds heard through another radio he'd been tinkering with. This time he wrote, The sounds I am listening to every night at first appear to be human voices conversing back and forth in a language I cannot understand. I find it difficult to imagine that I am actually hearing real voices from people not of this planet. There must be a more simple explanation that has so far eluded me. Since I always preach that a paranormal investigator's first imperative should be to attempt to debunk anything that seems to be out of the ordinary, I did find this possible explanation for what Tesla heard. The type of radio Tesla used is capable of picking up very low frequency radio signals from unseen sources, like electrical storms, atmospheric disturbances, and household electronics. Translated to audio, the signals can sound like the uncanny chatter of disembodied voices. Without hearing exactly what Tesla was listening to, I can't say that this does explain it, but rather it could possibly explain it. Prior to that initial 1901 diary entry, it said that Tesla had actually received another mysterious radio transmission in Colorado Springs in 1899 that's been attributed to aliens. I'll probably do a whole separate video on that theory. One Tesla quote that a lot of paranormal enthusiasts like to cling to as proof that Tesla was experimenting with spirit communication is the day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, it will make more progress in one decade than in all the previous centuries of its existence. People are split on what Tesla actually meant by this, or if he even actually said it at all. A lot of Tesla quotes are that way. Thomas Edison may not have left behind the same mystique as Nikola Tesla, but he was a bit of an eccentric in his own right. I'm not going to debate what he did or didn't actually invent, not today at least, but he was admittedly a pioneer of modern invention. And he certainly wasn't stupid or boring. For one thing, Edison had a huge workshop with numerous laboratory assistants, and he was known for conducting some really peculiar job interviews. For example, he judged potential employees based on how they ate soup. If the candidate added salt or pepper to their soup before tasting it, they were immediately denied the job. His reasoning actually kind of makes sense, though. He didn't want prejudiced people on his team who would jump to conclusions before experimenting. People who salt their soup before eating it assume that it's bland without even tasting it. If the candidate salted or peppered their soup after tasting it, they could commence with the interview. Let's not forget he also co-created those delightfully creepy talking dolls I showed you in a previous video. Another of Edison's eccentricities was that he always seemed to need to be doing whatever Tesla was doing, and thus began his own reported venture into spirit communication. By the 1920s, Edison really didn't need to be worried about what other inventors were doing. He could have easily retired and already secured his legacy as one of the world's greatest inventors. But he'd caught wind that his longtime frenemy Nikola Tesla had been receiving communications from the dead. Being a keen businessman, I'm sure he also recognized that there would be a decent market at the time for spirit communication devices. Edison was known as something akin to an agnostic, and he'd vocally criticized the seance-hosting mediums that had sprung up during the spiritualism trend. But in October of 1920, he told the American magazine, 
I have been at work for some time building an apparatus to see if it is possible for personalities which have left this earth to communicate with us. This apparatus later became referred to as a spirit phone. In another interview, this time with Scientific American, published in the same month and year, Edison said, I have been thinking for some time of a machine or apparatus which could be operated by personalities which have passed on to another existence or sphere. Though in this article, Edison states that he's merely thinking about this apparatus, the same article states that the apparatus which he is reported to be building is still in the experimental stage, as if indicating that there was a prototype. Forget about Tesla's alternating current, Edison was going for alternate dimensions. At the time, Tesla noted in his journal that Edison had been trying to use his patents to talk with specters. But while Edison was convinced Tesla could listen to spirits, Tesla seemed to believe he was hearing voices from outer space. While there's no actual proof that Edison's spirit phone even made it to the prototype stage, there are stories of its existence and attempts at using it. Whether or not this is true is still up for debate. As with everything, Edison approached the possibility of spirit communication scientifically. He told Scientific American, I don't claim that our personalities pass on to another existence or sphere. I don't claim anything because I don't know anything about the subject. For that matter, no human being knows. But I do claim that it is possible to construct an apparatus which will be so delicate that if there are personalities in another existence or sphere who wish to get in touch with us in this existence or sphere, this apparatus will at least give them a better opportunity to express themselves than the tilting tables and wraps and Ouija boards and mediums and other crude methods now purported to be the only means of communication. He said, I believe that if we are to make any real progress in the psychic investigation, we must do it with scientific apparatus and in a scientific manner, just as we do in medicine, electricity, chemistry, and other fields. He went on to say, this apparatus is in the nature of a valve, so to speak. That is to say, the slightest conceivable effort is made to exert many times its initial power for indicative purposes. He then explained it would be similar to the turning of a valve that starts a steam turbine. In the same way, the slightest effort from a spirit could influence the highly sensitive valve, and that action would be greatly magnified to give us whatever form of record we desire for the purposes of investigation. Edison also divulged that one of his employees, William Walter Dinwiddie, who'd been working on the spirit phone, had recently died, and that if the invention worked, he ought to be the first to use it if he is able to do so. He added, I do hope that our personality survives. If it does, then my apparatus ought to be of some use. That is why I am now at work on the most sensitive apparatus I have ever undertaken to build, and I await the results with the keenest interest. It said that Edison's purported experiments with spirit communication pulled from Albert Einstein's theories of quantum entanglement and special relativity. Edison theorized that if it's possible to convert mass to energy, then perhaps the spirits of living people become coherent units of energy when their bodies stop working. And if entangled particles can affect each other across great distances, as stated by the quantum entanglement theory, then maybe there's a way for those energy bundles to interact with our physical world. According to the book Edison vs. Tesla, The Battle Over Their Last Invention, Edison did make a spirit phone prototype, and he tested it in a 1920 scientific seance, inviting both mediums and scientists to observe. The spirit phone was described as similar to a projector sitting on a workbench. It emitted a thin beam of light onto a photoelectric cell. The illuminated cell would, in theory, detect the presence of forces and objects moving through the beam, including those invisible to the naked eye. Edison explained that if a being from another world were to attend the gathering and pass through the light, a meter hooked up to the photoelectric cell would alert them. After hours of observing the meter with no alerts, everyone had to accept that either the device didn't work or no spirits were present. Though some believe Edison's experiments with spirit communication to have been a hoax, an entry from his personal diary actually suggested that his interest was genuine. Edison is said to have continued working on his spirit phone 
throughout the 1920s until his death on October 13, 1931, at the age of 84. It's thought that perhaps Edison may have ultimately destroyed the device along with all the paperwork associated with it out of embarrassment from the failure of the experiment. But Edison's involvement in spirit communication didn't end there. While alive, Edison reportedly made a pact with his engineer, William Walter Dinwiddie, that whoever died first would attempt to make contact with the other. When Dinwiddie died in 1920, there's no record of him ever managing to contact Edison. However, when Edison died 11 years later, others attempted to get in touch with his spirit. In 1941, a group of researchers claimed that Edison contacted them during a seance. He allegedly relayed to them the plans to build his spirit phone. Though the group followed the instructions implicitly, the machine didn't work. Their note stating, Alas, the contraption did not seem to successfully transmit any life units. In 1967, Edison's spirit allegedly came through again with the help of a West German clairvoyant named Sigrun Suderman. Through Suderman, who was in a trance state, Edison spoke of his efforts to create equipment for recording voices from the other side. Edison also described how to modify TV sets and tune them to 740 megahertz to receive contact from spirits. Nikola Tesla died on January 7, 1943, at the age of 86. Though lots of modern paranormal enthusiasts have claimed to have contacted Tesla's ghost, I haven't come across anything very convincing. If anyone else has, feel free to send me a link. Today, you can go online and find ready-made versions of Tesla's spirit radio, or you can buy the plans and parts and make your own. Some paranormal investigators also use good old-fashioned Tesla coils to boost electromagnetic energy in their investigations. These days, there are multitudes of individual ghost hunting gadgets on the market, and endless ideas for new methods and devices, along with a myriad of ghost hunting apps you can install right on your phone. Most paranormal investigations involve a combination of science, spirituality, common sense, and open-minded wonder. There's really no right or wrong way to do something, when as Edison said, no human being really knows anything about the subject for sure. It's all conjecture and interpretation. A hundred years after Edison and Tesla experimented with their own spirit communication devices, the paranormal is still shrouded in mystery. And as curious as I am about pretty much everything, I'm not sure I really want this one completely figured out. Knowing there are things we don't know keeps life interesting. And one thing both Edison and Tesla seem to have in common is the realization that a lot of the fun is in the experimentation. That's all I have for you today. I hope you've enjoyed this story and will come back for more. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, and bring your friends, family, COVID pod, cult members, invisible friends, or enemies. And if you have a favorite piece of ghost hunting equipment, tell me about it in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching.